Hi, is this Eileen? Yes, it is. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, we're very excited to welcome our first guest for this evening. She is the sister of the man that we've been talking about uh, for the past 30 minutes or so, a very, very dear friend of ours and an amazing actor and painter. And uh, that, of course, is the one and only Erwin Keys. And we're very excited to welcome Erwin's sister on, Eileen Glick, to talk about the new book. Right. Yeah. So welcome to the show, Eileen. You're on with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. It's been a very exciting week for me, Mm -hmm. getting uh, Irwin's last wish, getting his book out. Well, let's start out by talking a little bit about that. I mean, I we knew Irwin for years, but I never knew he had written a book. So tell us a little bit about this journey and, and how this came about. Okay. Well, this journey started around 1980. Irwin has uh, always kept notes on the films, where he went, and he compiled all of these notes for years, all his movies. He drove, first he started driving a cab in New York, and he picked up some actors while he was going to school up in New Paltz, and he just felt like he was a square peg in a round hole. Mm -hmm. And then over the years with the book, it's just been uh, so many pieces of paper and then he started typing away a few years ago. And then not feeling very well in 2013, he had a lot of challenges his whole life. And we said it's time to get his book together together and he did he he worked really hard for a couple of months while i was out there and i promised him that this book will get out and it's a wonderful book for acting students it's funny erwin had a great sense of humor right and and in and he talks his words in his book different directors, funny situations, Um, talks about Steven Spielberg, he just wrote down all of these notes that people just wouldn't do, he sat in Steven Spielberg's seat when they were doing the Flintstones, nobody would ever (laughs) do that. Yeah, let, let me tell you too, this is Terry, hi, it's so great to talk to you. That was one thing he yes. was really proud of it, playing Joe Rockhead in the Flintstones movie. Yes. Joe Rockhead was Barney's uh, and Fred's very good friend. Mm-hmm. And he was in the two movies, and he had a great part, funny part. Irwin didn't have a lot of liners, ever. But whatever he said made the audience crack up. Right. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, yes, yeah, Sweezy Joe in Intolerable Cruelty. Yes. That was the funniest ending. He didn't come on the movie until three quarters the movie was over. And then by just putting the gun in his mouth, everybody knew him. Cone Brothers loved him. He loved the Cone Brothers. And the camera. The camera loved Irwin. He took, took great photography. I have, I've given away so many pictures. I went to Comic-Con to meet his friends and fans. Um, well, you know, that's, that's a good point because that's what I want to find out. Because, you know, when, when someone that you admire that's on the screen passes away, a lot of times there's a Facebook page that's left or whatever. And, and I saw that there was, and then I realized that you were involved. I didn't even know about you, and I think it's just a great thing that you're keeping his memory alive. At, at what point did you start, uh, you know, doing social media and, and making sure that everybody still remembered uh, Irwin and, and getting involved in, in some of these events that wound up leading to things like a little exhibit at the Hollywood Museum, for instance? For instance, that's true you know when Irwin got sick he had acromeglia which is a growth hormone every time I saw Irwin and I were always close he was my younger brother every time I saw him he looked different big hands big feet jaw 
difficult to manage, but he did. He did it. Certain films, he got hurt. Mm-hmm. But he just believed the show had to go on. Right. It happened in the Flintstones. show had to go on. And then... What ha- what he did was he, he just, at the same time in 1990, he picked up uh, watercolors, mm-hmm. fantastic artwork from his hands. Mm-hmm. He never thought anything special. He painted about 70 paintings. So after Irwin passed, I had all his costumes and the paintings and props. I live in New York, Yeah. and we drove a truck. My husband, Todd Barkin, Irwin loved jazz. My husband is an NEA jazz master, huh? and he would, he would talk to Irwin at night, and they would play Scrabble. <laughs> and Irwin always, when he came, came to New York, he would go to all the jazz clubs. Great. He must put that in. Right. But as we were uh, coming home from California by truck, we had a celebration at his house. A lot of people showed up and good friends. And then a friend of his wrote the Hollywood Museum about Irwin. Mm. It's like the day he the day he passed was the day he was written up in every newspaper, magazine all around the world. Right. He, he never would realize that he would be in the Hollywood Museum as a permanent exhibit. He never thought Hollywood took him that seriously. And it's incredible, was, too, Eileen. Right. Just think about the fact that being a, a character actor, not a lot of character actors get that much attention that Irwin did when he passed. He was the president. He was a permanent character actor like uh in each in each movie a principal excuse me the word is a principal character actor there you go in every movie um he we got home the hollywood museum got in touch with me and they said they would love to do an exhibit on Mm nerwin and then my husband todd we packed up we packed up eight boxes and the Hollywood Museum, my husband Todd Parkin just walked in because we have a jazz club here. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we have a lot going on. Right, right. And, and with Irwin, that's been our main function the last four years. Mm-hmm. We went out to the Hollywood, exi- Hollywood Museum for the opening of the exhibit, which is down in the Hall of Horrors, next to Vincent Price. Uh, Silence of the Lambs, huh? and the beautiful Anthony Hopkins, right next, to Anthony Hopkins. next to Anthony Hopkins, and it's a beautiful exhibit. That's Good. how we got there. Good company. All he, yes, all he wanted was the book. The book. Well, <laughs> the last two, three years, I've also had two art shows with the artwork, uh-huh. of which I would love love to put a little more in. The California area yeah. was a lot of the people know of Irwin work. Here, I had an art an art exhibit in New York at a wonderful place called the Jazz Gallery, and they had the exhibit up for about three or four months. It wasn't to sell; it was just to show. Right, right, right. Now but behind the music, behind the jazz. For for and then I did, sorry, go ahead. What? No, go ahead. Repeat. Okay, then I had the second art exhibit, April of this year, 2019. A curator saw his work from St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, and they teach a lot of children. They have wonderful artwork. They have a wonderful art gallery for the, the students in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So I had like a week showing there of which I sold three paintings. They really are beautiful. They are on Irwin and myself 
they're all around the computer. People mm -hmm. can find them. Mm -hmm. um, what else? And now we got the book done. Right. Well, let me That's ask you about the, yeah, it, it is, but let, let me ask you about the uh, the journey to do the book. Because just so listeners know, uh, the book is called Hollywood the Hard Way, The Life Story of Irwin Keyes. Now, knowing that this was, you know, Irwin's last wish for that to get out there, just because you have a book doesn't mean it's easy to get published and easy to get out there. So how did that journey go? Did you actually edit and all of that stuff yourself? Did you have people working with you? And how did it uh, end up getting published? We got a lot of help from friends, helped us a couple, two, two very, very dear friends helped us. Mm -hmm. And it was a labor of love. We spent several years editing it and going over it. And two very, very dear friends helped us finish it, to, to publish it on Kindle. Wonderful. We put pic pictures in there of his artwork, pictures of his movies that he talks about, all of them in the book, The Warriors. He talks about uh, Jefferson's Big Break, Moonlighting, Laverne and Shirley, CSI. And, you know, he was always funny, Irwin. He always had a joke. You know, residuals, they come in. 20 cents, 30 cents. <laughs> yeah. Irwin said to me, Eileen, don't laugh at it. There are many. There are many moves. <laughs> right. Really. He, but he was in many movies. <laughs> and I, and live stream, they keep playing them. Yeah. And Irwin is with us. I have his, his paintings showing downstairs at our jazz club, the Keystone Corner in Baltimore. So I have Irwin all around. Yeah. Well, all that was around. that was one of the things that we always loved about Irwin is that, you know, a lot of people, because he did get a lot of uh, notoriety for being in, you know, House of a Thousand Corpses with Rob Zombie, you know, later on in his career. But when we would always mention, you know, others, other projects, older projects, and he just loved talking about the stuff that not a lot of people knew about. Like we we showed him we had an old VHS copy of Frankenstein General Hospital and he started rolling on the floor laughing and he would sit there and tell stories for hours yep. about all of these little projects that you may have never heard of anymore. And I can imagine that that's kind of the same narrative feel that you get in the book, right? Yes, that's in the book. That's in the book, Oblivion, his early movies. Oblivion, um, Oblivion is, uh, there was a series uh, that he was in, Tales from the Crypt, all his, his early movies. It's great when he went... Um, to Romania to film that science fiction Oblivion. Friday the 13th, Guilty yeah. as Charged. All those early movies are, the are in the book. The Private Eyes, Zap, Dream Slashers, all of that. The yeah. Warriors, the Exterminator films. It's very humorous. It's and a great He was great in a book. lot of TV series. He was in uh, Laverne and Shirley and Police Squad and Moonlighting and Married with Children, 30-something, Growing Pain, Tales from the Crypt, CSI, Crime Scene Investigation. He was in a lot of films. And, of course, his famous roles as Hugo, the bodyguard, in Jefferson. Right. Yeah, he, he, loved, he loved talking about the Jefferson. <laughs> I've, I've got to ask you, because uh, when we first met Irwin, uh, we went to supper with him at a restaurant and interviewed him, and it wound up uh, being the spread in, in Videoscope magazine. He, at the time, was very, very opinionated about a certain subject that really bothered him, and, and that was the, uh, the actress that was supposedly killed by Phil Spector, because I guess that he was a friend of hers, and, and very, very oh. vocal about it. Did he, did he ever really tell you any controversial stories or any controversy in the book opinions such as things like that no that's no 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 but um that lady was i know it's the story you're talking mm -hmm. about no he did not talk about that yeah he didn't talk about that no 
He talked about meeting Shelley Winter mm -hmm. in New York, and she was nasty in the cab, mm -hmm. and he asked her to please get out. And then he met her back in Hollywood, and she said, you know, you look familiar to me. Because Owen, you know, if you saw the face, you would always remember right. you saw him somewhere. Right. You don't always remember the name, people. Oh, they know that picture. They know that face. And uh, he talks about directors. He particularly liked one, Sam Irvin. Mm -hmm. He's all over the screens now. Sam was, is great. He does horror. Works with Elvira. Right. He worked a lot with Irwin. I have uh, fans who have sent me, the, you know, he was like, they call it the bad cop of the Warriors. Mm -hmm. They send me dolls, little uh, dolls. People still write me. They bought Flintstone outfits, <laughs> Joe Rockheads. Yeah, the kids. Well, let me yep. ask you this, because a, happy a, a lot of people was wondering about, because, uh, you know, he got kind of a boost in the career as if, he didn't have one before. He always had a great career, but I mean, a lot of horror fans got to know him because of House of a Thousand Corpses. And, you know, I was, yep. I, I wished Rob Zombie would have used him more. There wound up being basically, you know, three films. Uh, he was only in House of a Thousand Corpses. Did Irwin ever say that he wished Rob would use him more? Well, House of a Thousand Corpses was filmed in 03. Mm -hmm. And it was only released not long, a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the, this last movie that he made fast, The Devil's Disciple or something, right. Sid, Haig, Sid Haig was in, who's no longer with us. But I think if Irwin was alive, I think he would have used him. Right. Yeah. Because as, as the same uh, character, the masked man. Because everybody knows Ravelli. Right. Every, but... But Rob Zombie, you know, you know, whatever. Yeah. Stuff, you know, strange. It's a strange situation. Right. But it was good for Irwin. It now, was great for Irwin. Before we wrap this up, I, I wanted to ask because obviously people can grab uh, a copy of the book, uh, Hollywood the Hard Way, uh, off of Amazon. Um, but uh, listeners were wanting to know, A, is there going to be any way to get like a physical copy of the book? Is there any plans on having it printed? Or is it only Kindle version? I'll tell you, I haven't done the printing. It's over 252 pages. Mm -hmm. And and then some of the the pictures are in color. I have, you know, I really haven't even thought about that. Right. Having it, the print, if I had the hard back, I might be able to travel around with it. Mm -hmm. Right. But now, you know, I don't know. I mean... Something that we have to look at down the road. Right, right. For down sure. the road. I'm, I'm just so glad to get the book on the road. To yes. tell you the truth, that I mean, that's that's my thing for you know for life. And hardback. I, I have so many. I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> I, but I, you know, back in the olden days, you know, I have the horror books. So right. I'll, I'll figure that out. Everybody, I don't, you know, we're in the internet world. Right. That's why I made it an e-book and not expensive. It's not making, it's not the idea to make the money. Right. It's just to have it, Irwin's wish fulfilled. His Absolutely. last wish. So it makes me feel comfortable at heart. Well, you know, there's but a lot even of... Even though I don't... There's a, there's the a lot of... Museum, right. Hmm? Hollywood Museum is yeah, a great I mean, thing. The Holly it's a great thing. Irwin wouldn't believe it. <laughs> so I hope he's flying around down there and, you know, wouldn't believe it, you know. Well, you know something? Um, there, there are so many angels that's looking out for Irwin, and I wouldn't be surprised one day. What if the greatest thing ever happened and they decide to make a movie out of your book? Who would you think... Oh. Who should play your brother? Now, that's got to be a hard question. Who, who would play your brother? Who, who would you want to play your brother? Oh, you know that is hard. It, it is. has it's... to be a hokey man or something, you know? Oh, I mean, it's hard. That's a, you could ask me that next week. 
you know. It, it would be hard to cast too, because Irwin was a very unique, you know, individual, and, and yeah, he sure was. He was. Yeah. He sure. So Todd just said he sure was. He was a one of a kind. And, and you and know, like, he's um, he reminds me of of some others I've met in the fact that these people that, that you see on the screen that are large and looming and people think that always are scary. Play, always play bad guys. Always play bad guys. They're the nicest pussycat little teddy bears <laughs> you've ever met in your life. That's exactly right. They yeah. are exactly. Yeah. But they play thugs. They have the look of a thug. Right. And um, they did, and it's, it's all good, you know. He was happy with everything he did. He wished he got, to, after intolerable cruelty, he wished that he was taken a little more serious in Hollywood, yeah. not just as um, horror. Right. Right. You know, not just horror. You know, he loved working with the Cone Brothers and George Clooney. Oh, yeah, oh, he loved know? George Clooney, that's for sure. And, and, he, and, took, uh, he took a lot of pride. He took a lot of pride in, in, in the craft of acting. He was yeah. a real professional actor. And, and he was always very proud of his acting abilities from from his early life, and he was a, you know he started out in broad in, in New York. Right. He's, he's a he's a trained actor, so right. he, he really was very proud of that aspect of his work, and and he always I think he always felt like he didn't get quite as recognized as he should. Although he was right. appreciative, he was a true professional. And he was appreciative of any chance to work. I mean, yeah. he was a real pro. But but in his heart of hearts, he expressed to me that sometimes he wished he could have been taken more seriously as a real dramatic actor. Yeah. Because he was a great actor. Well, like the uh, movie... There are, few, uh, there are a few films where he shows that, you know. Yeah. And, and he... Yeah, and he showed it in early theatrical productions. I mean, right. he was always a, a very fine actor from a very young age. So, but, but he, all in all, he... he Took, he took a, the bitter with the sweet, and he was he was very happy with his career. And he had this one wish: he wanted to, you know, he wanted us to publish this book, which which we have done, and we're very proud of it. And you know, one day it may be a hardcover book, but we're very proud that it's in print now, that it's in that it's online. Right, and people all over the world can get a copy of it for five ninety nine. There you go. It's really wonderful. I want to find out too from, from you because I, you know, now that I have you on the phone, uh, I didn't really realize about the connection that, that uh, your brother-in-law had with you uh, with jazz. Tell me about your jazz club. Well, it's it's. Uh, I had a legendary jazz club in San Francisco, the Keystone Corner, uh, which was in San Francisco. It was called the Birdland of the '70s. Mm -hmm. It was from 1972 to 1983. And then I was the programming director at Jazz at Lincoln Center uh, for for about you know fifteen years, wow. and then and then when when I I was just named an NEA Jazz Master uh, in 2018, which is the highest award our government gives in jazz. Mm. So I I met a guy in, in D.C. and we became partners here in Baltimore, and so the Keystone Corner Baltimore is now open. Which uh, this is a city that hasn't had a jazz club in over thirty-five years, so awesome. we're very proud and very thrilled about the whole thing. That is awesome. Perfect. Yeah, so I mean, I worked with people like Miles Davis, Grover Washington, wow. Ahmed Jamal, all the, Dexter Gordon, all the greatest jazz musicians of all, McCoy Tyner, all the greatest jazz players of all time since the early seventies, and I'm still working with Ron Carter and. And all these great players here at, at, at Keystone Corner. Wow! Wow! So uh, you know, I'm very, 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 very proud of, of being. You know, the Keystone Corner is a legendary jazz venue, and we're very proud to have it here in Baltimore. And Eileen and I have moved to Baltimore to do this, you know, do this club here for the uh -huh. people of Baltimore, and they're they're very thrilled about it. Right. And Irwin loved jazz, and he came a lot. He came a lot. I was I created a club. At Jazz at Lincoln Center called Dizzy's, and and that became a fame. It's still doing very very well there at Jazz at Lincoln Center, mm -hmm. and I'm very proud of that as part of my legacy. So um, and now we're in Baltimore and, and bringing music to the people here, and, and they're they're thrilled about it. Well, yeah. see, I I think that's the thing that every Urban Keys fan should 
make a journey to could come on out to your club and hear the great music and, and meet uh, you and I guess your wife is probably there too. And meet you know, we're there every night. We're there every night. Everyone's <laughs> paintings are on the wall. We're there every night and, and celebrating great music and, and yeah. And uh, you can see him on on uh, you know on our Keystone Corner Baltimore dot com website. Uh, you know they could they, people can go and see exactly who's playing here. I mean the greatest jazz players in the world play here every single night of the year. Wow. I mean wow. Michael Henderson, you are my starship. Played last night. Tierney Sutton, who's from there where you are, from L A. She's here tonight and tomorrow night. I got Cindy Blackman Santana, the legendary wife of Carlos Santana, is here oh. next week. Then Roy Haynes and Eddie Palmieri is playing here for two weeks, and we're going to celebrate Eileen's 70th birthday with wow. Eddie Palmieri's 83rd birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yep. we're going to celebrate. Time. So you can time come to any time and be our guest. Fantastic. You, you guys are. We're on Seaport. We're right here in the marina in Baltimore. Nice. Harbor East marina. Maybe I'd be lucky and one of my favorite directors, John Waters, would come in <laughs> and, and visit the club. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, we love John Waters. We, <laughs> we adore John Waters. And, and, and he, he's had some funny things to say about Baltimore. He's, he's a very, very <laughs> wonderful guy. Yes, yes. From what, I, under, from what he's I understand. One of our heroes. From what I understand, President Trump said some things about Baltimore, too, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, but we'll let him say. He's entitled to his own opinion. But, <laughs> but yes. you know, we, we're, we're very proud of the city of Baltimore, and it's the home of Billie Holiday, yeah. And yeah. Ubi Blake, and some of the greatest jazz musicians of all time. So we're keeping up a big, a, a major tradition going here. Why am I not surprised that, why am I not surprised that Irwin's family is all very cool? I mean, yeah, you guys are, yeah. are happening and having fun and, and living life, and that's the way to do it. That sounds great. I love jazz. Jazz well, is... Yeah, jazz is, 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 you know, it's all about communication. It's about telling your own story in your own way, and that's what Irwin Keyes did. It yeah. did, absolutely. He's telling his own story in his own way. Right. You know? And uh, as we wrap this up, I want to remind people, if you want to hear Irwin's story told his own way, you should pick up a copy of the book. The book is called Hollywood the Hard Way, The Life Story of Irwin Keys. I want to thank both of you for joining us tonight. And uh, as always, keep thank in you. touch. Uh, Eileen, you know we've talked over the years because we, we truly love Irwin so much. And we appreciate that both of you are keeping his legacy alive. And okay. thank you so much from the bottom of our heart. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the weekend, you guys. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.